Hey, this is Irreverent Aegis here, and in this video I'm going to take you through my Castle Thorn, Bane of Thorns, Trifecta Run. That's the hard mode, speed run, and no death all in one. For the first four boss fights and all of the ad pulls, I am wearing Arcasis, which gives everyone 42 ultimate whenever I pop a potion, with a 30 second cooldown to that ability. So I run two infused potion cooldown enchants, so I can pretty much pop a potion every 30 seconds and give the ultimate. I'm also wearing Blood Spawn, so I can generate ultimate myself very quickly, so I can drop Colossuses pretty much at will. I'm also running Perfected Yulnokrin, so I can give everyone minor courage. And I run Bloodlord's Embrace pretty much all the time, so I front bar Perfected Unlocker and I back bar Arcasis. For this first boss fight, it's pretty straightforward. Have the DPS, avoid the fire, and then when that uh, boss does the telegraphed pounce, just run over and bash to avoid any issues. So, pretty straightforward. That's really the only mechanic to worry about is that pounce and the fire, which explodes if you don't kill him fast enough. The hard mode boss fight takes my group about 10 minutes to complete, so we actually have our healer run DPS skills and gear for all the ad pulls in the first four bosses, that way we have enough time to finish the speed part of the trifecta. What's really nice about running three DPS for most of this dungeon is you can burn through a lot of boss mechanics without worrying about them because they simply don't happen. This in particular is one of those. So what I have my three other players do, I have them stand back in the beginning here because sometimes this boss likes to run away from me before I can taunt it. So they stand back just in case that happens. But anyway, you can see with the three DPS here, this is going to go pretty rapidly. So everyone drops all their ultimates in the beginning. I pop a potion because I'm wearing their cases and give them ultimate back. But we're not even going to get ultimate by the time this guy dies. Pretty much the only mechanic you really need to worry about here as a tank is when he goes invisible. When he goes invisible, he's going to come back with a really strong heavy attack. So when that happens, just make sure you hold block. Other than that, let your DPS do their jobs and it ends very rapidly. For these trash pulls, there are a couple of things to look out for. The flying dudes explode when they die for big damage, so make sure everyone avoids them. They hit really hard. And then the two-handers are always, for whatever reason, off to the side. So make sure you taunt them and keep them away as they can one-shot your DPS. So again, the flying dudes and the two-handers are the priorities here. This boss fight is pretty straightforward as well. I'll go over the mechanics that you need to look out for as they happen. This boss does put a damage over time on you that can be purged. However, it's not really that big of a damage over time, so you can usually just self-heal your way through it pretty easily, even if you don't have a healer. This first thing when he throws the scythe, everyone before the fight should pick a direction that they're going to go. I always go towards the closest wall. We have one person just stay and then the other two go left and right. One of our DPS is going to stick around and DPS the scythe down and then throw it at the ceiling to summon those viscera which help us out. After that phase, we go back to the boss and he summons a big ad. The big ad hurts pretty bad with his heavy attack. It shouldn't one shot you if you block it, but it's easier to just roll dodge it just so you don't get double heavied. But other than that, he goes down pretty rapidly if you have 3 DPS. The boss will fly in the air and summon his own viscera, so it's very helpful if your viscera go attack it, so that's why you throw that scythe at the ceiling to summon your own. Pretty much that is all that you need to worry about as a tank are those things. The rest of your group, there will be a dot that follows people around, so just make sure you avoid that big circle if you aren't the tank, as it will need to be kited away from the group. Pretty much after that, it's rinse and repeat. After the scythe is thrown, he goes to a corner, summons a big ad, we drop our ultimates, etc. And again, just make sure you keep up aggro on the two adds, and then watch the boss melt. Two more priority adds to talk about are the big cats. 
face them away from the group, they actually have a Conal that doesn't look like a Conal that can one-shot people if they are standing in the wrong spot. And then they also have the Pounce, so just keep the Pounce away from your team, as that can also hurt pretty bad. The other priority add to worry about are Gargoyles. So the Gargoyles, I just taunt them and run away because their heavy attacks will one-shot you through a block, most likely. So you can see over here, I'm just kind of standing far away from them. The fourth boss, Talfig, is another one that is trivialized by having three DPS who can burn him before any real mechanics happen. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to taunt him, face him away, we're all going to drop our ultimates again, I'm going to use our cases to give everyone 42 ultimate back as soon as we drop them all, which is really nice, give him that ultimate back quickly. He is going to do a few things to look out for. He does this beam, which you just need to step out of. He summons gargoyles, which you can pretty much effectively ignore. You can taunt them if you want to. He also does a heavy attack, which you can simply block or roll dodge, and then he does a ground smash ability, which puts a big AoE on the ground, which again, you just step out of. I will start pulling him towards one side of the room, because once we get all six gargoyles up, it can get pretty cramped, so if I start him by one side of the room, if it does tend to get cramped and our DPS is a little slower than usual, I can just move him to the open side, and we can finish him off. Around 30%, if you don't have really strong DPS, you will need to pay attention to a beam that he puts on everybody, so the, all the DPS, healer, whatever, they're going to need to spread out and just keep moving so the beam doesn't hit them. He won't even have a chance to do the beam here because we're going to kill him before that mechanic ever happens. The hard mode here is quite challenging, especially for mag DPS, due to its heavy stamina requirements and large amounts of physical damage. So before I pull the boss, we spend about two minutes making changes to gearing, food, and skills. For sustain, our DPS switched over to Orzaga's Smoke Bear Hodge, which gives max health and tri-stat recovery, and then they use tri-stat pots as well. For skills, one of our DPS put on Crushing Shock to help with interrupts, I'll explain that during the fight, and both put on Barrier as one of their ultimates. Regarding monster sets, for the DPS, Grunwolf or Engine Guardian are both very helpful for sustain. The healer went with Twilight Remedy for a large heal over time, with Meritorious Service for the extra 3500 group resistance. We did mess around with her scenes instead of Meritorious for extra stam recovery, but Meritorious ended up working better. The healer also made sure to slot Purge to proc Meritorious Service, and then Blood Altar and Healing Orbs were an absolute must. Our healer was a Sork, so he went with the Atronaut Ultimate, another Synergy, and Barrier. As the tank, I went with Mighty Glacier on the front bar and Arcasis on the back bar. As a Necro tank, Mighty Glacier allowed me to slot Ghostly Embrace to give everyone in the group major resolve, while also being an effective crowd control and source of major maim. Arcasis with that cooldown enchant on the potions gave everyone ultimates back very quickly so we could almost always have a barrier ready from 20% to completion. And for my monster set, I ran Stonekeeper for the resources, and I also had Bloodlord's Embrace on my bar for the magic of sustain. For my ultimates, I ran Shield Wall on the front bar and Colossus on the back bar. Shield Wall is incredible because it's really cheap and allowed me to heavy attack to restore stamina without worrying about having to block. Last up, we have Champion Points, which should be set by everyone before coming into the dungeon to save time. So I won't give exact values, but here are some ideas. For the green tree, put a ton in Tumbling to reduce the cost of Roll Dodge and a bit in Warlord to reduce the cost of Break Free. Mooncalf for stamina recovery may also be helpful if stamina sustain becomes an issue for anyone, but it might take away from having enough in other trees. For the red tree, it seems that everything here is physical based damage, so hardy and physical resistant are both very important, so light armor focus for mag DPS and medium armor focus for stam DPS. Thick skinned and ironclad are the other high priorities, as damage over time and direct damage are both important to mitigate. After all gear, skill, and food swapping, my group is right at 17 minutes, so we're ready to take on Lady Thorn. I'll put a slide up at the end with a summary of all of this info. For the first 20% of this fight, Lady Thorn is in the sky, and there are two mechanics to pay attention to. The first is the big AoEs that show up and then move. It's pretty obvious after a few attempts where they're going to move based on where they spawn, so your team should get the hang of this pretty quickly. If they get hit with one of those AoEs, it hurts quite a bit and it stuns them. Usually it will end up in death unless you have a barrier up. As the tank, you can survive it, no big deal for you. You just need to break free. 
The second mechanic is the circle that spawns on the ground. Everybody needs to be inside of that circle, because outside the turf circle, there's a lot of damage over time that happens. Nobody can survive for very long outside of the circle, so it's very important that they're in the circle. As the tank, something else to note is that every time Lady Thorn swipes you, no matter what percentage she's at, you'll get a debuff stack on you. You'll see it in the bottom right. You can kind of see the number going up every time she swipes me. This actually can be purged to remove some stacks. But my guess is that every stack I have of that, I take more damage. If you go into your menu and actually check out the tooltip for this, it's actually not helpful. It doesn't give any information at all. So that's just my guess based on all of my runs in here. I tend to die quicker or take more damage when I have more stacks. Between 80% and 60%, Lady Thorn's mechanics change. What she does is she'll actually disappear. She'll kind of do like a ballerina type or matrix move type move, and a big AoE will appear underneath her. When that happens, we say get out. I tend to call out mechanics as the tank, so I'll say get out. Everybody roll dodges away from her as that big AoE will kill people very quickly. She also does this attack where she goes invisible and targets the person farthest away from her. This either needs to be blocked or roll dodged as it does a hefty amount of physical damage. With enough mitigation which we have in this group, it shouldn't one shot, but it's best to just block. The other part, after she does that matrix move, you see the big AoEs going outwards. They're going to start going inwards, we call that converging and we need to get very far away from her when she's converging, as when she finishes converging, it will one-shot anybody, including me, if I'm inside the converging circle. When she's on the ground, she'll also do a very slow, heavy attack, so getting the timing down is pretty important for the tank. You don't want to roll dodge too early, as the range on it is deceptively giant, and if you have stacks of that diseased flesh debuff on you, it will probably one-shot you, even through a block. So make sure you roll dodge that on time. At 60%, things get really fun. I call this the super happy fun time circle. It's that circle, but now it moves. A couple things happen here. Lady Thorn will perch up in the sky and she'll randomly fly down through your group. You have to roll dodge that or not be around it. Very important. Otherwise, it'll knock you back out of the circle and you also need to break free, so you lose a lot of stamina. Next thing is this Blood Guardian here. He is the priority ad that I need to taunt. He does heavy attacks, light attack swipes, and he also does an attack where he puts his arms over his head and smashes the ground. It's very important that this is interrupted, which is why one of our DPS has an interrupt on. I try to get the interrupts as well, as sometimes other people are roll dodging. However, it is very challenging to be able to get the interrupts at close range, so that's why we have, again, that guy with Crushing Shock. We are intentionally not killing the Blood Guardian, because another one will spawn if we kill him too early. So what we do, there are little scamps. The scamps with those blood corruption balls on the ground that can be synergized. After four of those, this phase ends. So what we do is we make sure we have three on the ground before we kill the Blood Guardian. So after three scamps are killed, we go ahead and kill the Blood Guardian. Then the fourth one will come out, we'll kill him, and hit the last one, and we'll end this phase. During this entire phase, you will get one of those exploding circles that show up. These can be roll dodge. You can actually be in them by the time the roll dodge ends, <clears throat> as long as you roll dodge at the right time. So again, it doesn't matter if you're in them at the end of your roll dodge, it simply matters that you roll dodge at the correct time to avoid taking damage by them. But anyway, after that, we go back into the next phase, which between 60% and 30%, it's the same as between 80% and 60%. She'll be on the ground, she'll disappear, um, she'll converge, she'll do the, invisib the invisibility attack, she'll do heavy attacks. The only difference now is instead of one exploding circle, which is in the 80% to 60%, you'll always now have two exploding circles. So it's very important that people get used to this as there's going to be two exploding circles from here on, including the 20% to 0% super happy fun time part two.
One thing that I forgot to mention earlier is that my Mundus Stone as the tank, I actually switched it to the Steed for this fight. That extra 10% movement speed is very helpful during the phase where you have the moving circle, or the two phases where you have the moving circle, as it allows you to move faster even as you block with your shield, which is very important for keeping pace with that circle while you're trying to stay in the center of it. So again, the Steed Mundus Stone, very helpful for this fight. Finally, while we're waiting for the next phase at 30%, which is just her flight phase again, I'll go over our barrier rotation. So all of our DPS and our healer have barrier on their bar. This is very helpful because sometimes you get really bad RNG with the exploding circles during the Super Happy Fun Time Part 2. Again, there's going to be always two circles instead of one, and then there's also single circles that appear, and sometimes the placement of these makes it really hard to get out of them, and sometimes the timing on them, they'll be staggered, so that way even if you time the roll dodge correctly on the first one, the second roll dodge will not be able to be done fast enough. So we will have a barrier rotation, and that's pretty much the only ultimates that everyone in the group runs, except for me, I run shield wall, so that way I can maintain my resources. It helps that I'm running Arcasis because it allows everyone to get their barriers back fairly rapidly. So that's what we do during the 20% to 0% execute. Here, this part is deceptively difficult for the no-death, when she flies up in the air between 30% and 20%, because we'll have those two things and we'll have a circle that doesn't move. So we actually try to nuke her as fast as possible. You'll see our team member almost die. He got hit by two or three circles there. The only reason he survived is because of all the extra damage mitigation we provide with our sets, and we just happened to luckily pop a barrier right before it happened. And that's the only reason we ended up getting this run. Now at 20%, we have Super Happy Fun Time Circle number two. The difference here is again, now we have two exploding circles followed by a single exploding circle. So that's extra fun, even more roll dodging that needs to be done and even more stamina drain. Other than that, it's pretty much the same. We have a Blood Guardian, we have her flying through the group and we have scamps. Again, we need to get four scamps thrown before this phase ends, except the difference here in the hard mode is that this phase actually never ends. You stay in the circle the entire 20% to 0%. So the entire execute, you're in the circle. You don't have any more blood guardians, so the important thing is, again, you kill three scamps before you kill the blood guardian, and then you kill the fourth scamp, and you'll never get another one of those blood guardians ever again. From this point onward, you're going to see ample amounts of barriers cast, ample amounts of me casting my shield wall ultimate. Again, that allows me to block the entire time while heavy attacking and getting my resources back. So I tend to pop my shield wall anytime I'm low on stamina. I also, because I'm running Arcasis with potion cooldown enchants, you can see that I always switch to my back bar to pop a potion, give everyone 42 ultimate, which just happens to almost refill my shield wall ultimate. So it's really nice for sustain running the potion cooldowns um, for multiple reasons. So we just took down that last Blood Guardian, popped another barrier. We're going to kill this last scamp, and I'm going to throw it into the ceiling. And once I throw this into the ceiling, it is critical that we have a barrier cast <clears throat> and that I taunt her immediately because she's really far away and she has a ranged attack that will one-shot somebody if she hits them before they're taunted. So if for some reason we're a little too far away and I can't taunt, or if my timing's a little bit off and I can't taunt right away, the barrier will protect somebody from that one-shot. This last 20% or 4 million health is super hectic. Not only do we have to stay inside of the circle, we also have the exploding circles, and we also have all of her ground mechanics, which are very difficult, especially for me because I need to watch out for her heavy attack, which the timing can get a little crazy with the exploding circles combined with the heavy attack. Like right there, I just chose to get really far away and roll dodge twice because that's about all I can do. We also have adds coming up left and right. They need to die, so being able to have AoE attacks by the DPS is very important, and I try to taunt and crowd control as many as I can with my taunt and my agony totem. Meanwhile, we're keeping up all of our barriers, and I'm casting potions like I normally do. 
and casting shield wall so I can block and heavy attack at the same time. Overall, this is super fun if you like torturing yourself and doing this, you know, a dozen times before you get the achievement. But overall, it was worth it as you see her die. So that's pretty much it. Again, I'm going to post up a little slide showing a summary of how we set up for this fight right now. But if you liked what you saw and you liked my explanations, please subscribe to my tanking channel here on Irreverent Aegis. I would really appreciate it.